Like Jesus. And I want to read from Philippians 1, Philipp, I'm sorry, Philippians 2, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind. Him 492, like Jesus.
next song is 618, 618. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. And we invite you at the sound of the organ to please stand. So hymn number 618, stand up, stand up for Jesus. And I want to read from Psalm 71, 16. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign God, sovereign Lord. I will pro proclaim your righteous deeds, yours alone. Please stand and sing with us hymn number 618. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. <laughs> Happy Sabbath. This is the Graham family. My name is Crystal. David and I are the venture directors here at Tampa First, and we've been involved in it for six years now. Good morning. Um, my name is Ashley, and this is my sister Alice. Um, this is Lindsay, and this is my brother Logan. And just as a, a little bit of history about the, the Grams, we moved here about two years ago in June from Orlando, Florida. And we, uh, we enjoy the adventure ministry. If there's anybody that's interested in joining the adventure ministry, please come see us. Uh, I have to put that plug in there. Uh, at this time, though, we're going to, uh, if we'll all stand and uh, welcome each other.
we invite you to look in your hymnals for hymn number three, uh, 370, 370, Christ for the World. Hymn number 370, 370. Please stand. church. It's time for our morning prayer. All those that have prayer requests can come up and put them in the prayer box. I'm going to read from Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. When, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And when, I, when I read this, it struck me that God told us in this verse to ask him for everything and then thank him. So even in that, his mercy shows that he's telling us, ask me what you want, and then you can thank me. Usually I thank him first, and then ask him for something. But even in that, God is merciful. He says, go ahead and ask me first, and then you can thank me for everything I do for you. So, uh, where possible, let's, let's kneel as we ask God. Great Heavenly Father, thank you for this week, Lord. Thank you for being with us and protecting us and bringing us to your house of worship where we can give you thanks for everything you do for us, for your creation, for separating this day for us so that we can come and rest from our week and thank you and be among those that love you and want to be in heaven with you. Lord, we we ask for all those that are ailing from different challenges that this world brings upon us, be it sickness or economic problems or family problems. We put them all at your feet, Lord. Be with all those that are having challenges with their health, 
Lord, we, we raise all their names to you. You know who they are. Be with them, Lord. Comfort them. Return their health to them, Lord. Be with our church. Be with Julie, who will speak to us today, Lord. Bless her and help her as she shares the word of Christ with us. Thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that you give us, our jobs, our health. Help us to remember you in everything we do and always glorify your name. For we ask all this in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's now time for our tithes and offering. Will the deacons please stand? Great Lord, we come to you with our tithes and offering. We ask that you multiply them greatly, Lord, for your glory and honor. Bless those that will be giving and also those that cannot give, Lord. We thank you and bring you a small part of your blessings to us. We thank you in the name of Jesus, amen.
Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Brad asked me to speak today because uh, this, the second service is Tampa Adventist Academy uh, special service. So he wanted to keep the theme because um, he knew that, or he asked me to speak about either parenting or family or uh, children, something of that nature. And it reminded me of what John Wilmot said. Before I got married, I had six theories about raising children. Now I have six children and no theories. <laughs> I don't have six kids, but uh, sometimes I feel like it. <laughs> I do have four, and you know who that fourth one is. <laughs> Let's bow our heads for prayer as we get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for this Sabbath morning. I pray that you will be with us as we open your word. Um, we invite you to share with us what it is you want us to learn today. Take away all the distractions from our hearts, our minds, and be with us as we listen. Uh, be with me as I speak, and uh, speak through me today. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, it's easy to make all kinds of judgments on parents as you see them in the grocery store with their screaming, whiny child. How many of you have ever said, all that kid needs is a, a, a pat on the uh, rear side? Yeah. Or, you know, I would never do it like that. When, I, when Brad and I got married, we went to Michigan, and I was working on my master's in religious education with an emphasis in family life. So, of course, I learned all kinds of theories, but I had no children myself at that point. And it's, um, it's been a journey since then. Until we can walk in someone's shoes, we never know what they're going through, what their experience is. And we should never judge or criticize what another parent is doing. That's not to say that everybody's doing it right. Let's look at some parents in the Bible. Name some parents in the Bible that have made some really big mistakes. Who can you think of? Who did I hear? Uh, Eli. Yes. Anybody else? Aaron? Aaron, yes. Okay. Who else? David. David was a man after God's own heart. But he really messed up sometimes, didn't he, in his parenting. Who else? Samuel. Samuel. Here I am, Lord. Samuel. Uh, what about Lot? Yeah, I really think some of the stuff he did to his daughter sounded pretty rotten. Uh, Jacob. Was Jacob a, a wonderful father? Ah, he had some, some preferential treatment going on among his kids. Yes. Okay, let's think about some good parents, some parents that uh, you think of that did a really good job in the Bible. Mary. Hannah, Mary, even Mary, though, lost sight of her son, right? Yeah, for a day and a half, didn't know where he was. Okay, who else can you think of? Well, Jesus wasn't a parent of a child, but he is our parent, right? Yes, and we will talk about that. Who else can you think of? Yeah. <laughs> Prodigal son's father. Now, of course, that was a parable. Jochebed. Oh, yes. Moses' mother. Okay. So, in my Masters of Family Life, I learned all kinds of theories, but special circumstances and three castle boys has been enough to just throw those theories out the window. <laughs> but over time, my oldest son now will be 16 this year, over time you do learn a thing or two, right, about parenting. That's the beautiful thing about grandparents, that they can come and, and help. Or, and, and I'm going to be talking about parenting, and some of us are beyond what we're discussing today, but that doesn't mean you can't take this information, share it with someone else, or even apply it to your own life in your relationships with other people that you uh, work with, maybe in the, biz in the workplace. Some of these principles can be applied, too. Now, 
what's comforting to me is even David, even Mary, these people who were people after God's own heart. Mary was chosen because of her submission to God. They even made mistakes. And that's comforting to me because I have made some mistakes as a parent and I will continue to make mistakes. Anybody with me on that? Yes. But what has God told us? What has he told us is our mission as the church? As the church. What is our mission? To go and make disciples. Preach into all the world and make disciples. In Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. Well, we cannot forget the mission field in our own home. We need to make disciples of our own children, our own grandchildren, the children in our neighborhood, perhaps, whose parents are not uh, seeing that mission, that, that necess necessity to teach them about Jesus. So God has given us the mission. The sermon title is Mission Possible. Let's take a look at Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. This, in a Christian education, we call it the mandate for Christian education. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 is in Hebrew called the Shema. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, um, that's a lot. That's a lot to say. When should we be teaching our children? What does this say? When you talk, when you sit, when you walk, and when you lie down. Basically, that's, that's covering everything, right? That's all the time. Repeat with me. When should we be teaching our children? All the time. And how should we be teaching them? In verse 7, what does it say? Diligently. That means we don't just let it happen. We don't just expect that it will happen in Sabbath school. We don't just, oh, well, it's going to happen. We don't just talk about it sometimes. We have to teach them diligently. Do you see how this is a mandate for Christian education? It says, hey, if you want to, does it say that? No, it says you shall. That's, that's the same language as the Ten Commandments, right? You shall. It's a mandate. But it's not an easy mission for us. It's, it, sometimes as a parent, it's a mission inconvenient. Kids can be kind of inconvenient at times. You gotta think about, oh, well, what do I do with the kids? Especially in, in our stage of parenting, the kids have to go here and here and practice and games and all over Tampa Bay and uh, all this kind of stuff. It's, it can be inconvenient at times, so it can be a mission inconvenient. It can certainly be a mission irresponsible if you think about the money that you spend on your children. Now, <clears throat> uh, Mason has a, a good friend, Giovanni, and he says, I'm not going to have children. Do you know how much children cost? <laughs> he thinks it's irresponsible financially to have children. He is a smart child, isn't he? <laughs> and I say to him, Giovanni, but there's so much reward from having children. But my pocketbook thinks this is an irresponsible thing because, you know, these kids are not recontributing their finances to our mission. So at this point, so it may be a mission irresponsible. And at many times, it seems to be a mission impossible. Anybody with me on that? Anybody feel like, 
this is impossible. This child is impossible. <laughs> yes, yes. But God never gives us an impossible mission. He never gives us an impossible mission. Okay, mission impossible. Who was the agent in the movie? Anybody remember the name? Ethan Hunt. Yes. And what about other secret agent spies? What are some names? James Bond. I don't know any more than that. I'm really... <laughs> Those are the two I can think of. James Bond, Ethan Hunt. Now these spies, these agents were trained. They had to react to anything that was thrown their way, correct? They had to spend a lot of time preparing for their missions. And it would seem to be an impossible mission, but they were always able to, to pull out, correct? So they weren't just reacting, they were proacting. They had to prepare and train for what was going to be presented to them. And that's what we need to do as parents. We can't just react. We have to proact. Now, how do we do that? Take a look at verse 4. How do we train and prepare ourselves? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Verse 5 says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. That's how we prepare. If we are giving all of ourselves to Christ, are we spending time with God in prayer? Are we spending time in the Word? These are the things that prepare us for our day's mission. And I am guilty, guilty as sin of this kind of thing. But I, am I putting other things in my mind that will detract from that mission? Are we seeing media? Are we reading things? Are we uh, doing things that will detract from that mission? Now, verse 8. Let's take a look. We've already talked about when we should be, in verse 7, we should be doing these things when we talk, when we sit, when we walk, when we lie down, and when you rise up. So that's all the time. And you shall bind them on a, as a sign of your hand. So those are the things we do, the actions. And they shall be as frontlets on your forehead. This is a reference to the, um, the Pharisees. They would, or because of this, the Pharisees would take Scripture verses, verses that they memorized, and put them in little boxes and wear them either on their forehead or on their arm. And the more verses you memorize, the more of Scripture that you memorized, the bigger the box you had. So if you were walking around like a unicorn, then you were a really holy person, right? So it, it's reminiscent, though. It, it's about what we think, what we do with our hands, what we think in our minds. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, what took place at the gates in biblical times? That's where business occurred. That's where business transactions occurred. So in our businesses, we should be teaching our children diligently of the commands of Jesus, the commands of God, the commandments. And this is referring to the Ten Commandments, which has just been reiterated in Deuteronomy 5. It's re, um, reviewing the Ten Commandments. And so when it says, and these commandments which I give to you today shall be upon your heart, these commandments, and the commandments of God reflect his character. So that's what we should be teaching our children is his character in our business interactions. So at work, even when we are at work, we may not be with our children, but if what we are doing if we are still teaching our children diligently in our interactions at work, in our um, homes, they should be on your doorposts. So what you do in your home should be teaching your children diligently. In every room of the house. Okay, <clears throat> so how do we do this? With all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our what? our might. 
we need to stay in a close relationship with him. Now, some of this stuff, um, yeah, that's all well and good, but how do we do it practically? What is the practicality? How do we teach our children? I'm going to offer you four C's, four C's for practical biblical parenting. The first C is consistency. Why is that important? If we're not teaching them all the time, if we're only teaching them sometimes, they're going to be learning something the other times, even if we don't think we're teaching them, but they're going to be learning. So we need to be consistent in our parenting, not just when it's convenient. And I tell you what, this is a struggle for me with my health problems. Sometimes I don't have the energy to put forth, and it can require a lot of energy, right? And in teaching, this is one thing that, that we have to be is consistent in our rules, consistent in our management, in our classroom management. Otherwise, the kids know, and then they can take advantage of you. So consistency. Now, um, I'm going to step on some toes here, but all the time, God says mandate. He mandates that we should be teaching our children all the time, even when we're at work. So when we are, work, are at work, where are our children? Are they in a place where they're going to be learning of Christ's character? Are they in a place? Have we made it possible so that even when we're at work, they are still learning Christ's character? They are still learning about God. So Christian education is part of this mandate. We need to sacrifice. We need to realize that education, what's taking place during the day with our children, what are they learning? And that's why our Seventh-day Adventist schools are very important because that's how they learn during the day. We can't be with them 24 hours a day. So who are they learning from in those other hours? And that's a segue into second service, and Tampa Adventist Academy is going to be here. Okay, for the next three C's, what's the first C? Consistency. For the next three C's, we're going to look at Luke 15. Turn in your Bibles. Luke 15, verses 11 through 32. This is the parable of the prodigal son. Now, I don't want to look at the son. I want to look at the father because that's what this parable is truly about. It's about the father. Luke 15, verses 11 through 32. We're going to see the other three C's in this story. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered, he wasted his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be in need. And he went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. And he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field, 
And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things might be. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began entreating him, pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you. I have never neglected a command of yours, and yet you have never given me a kid that I might be merry with my friends. A kid, not a, not a kid kid, but a young goat. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with harlots, you killed the fattened calf for him. And the father said to him, My child, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to be merry and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. That's a good father. Let's talk about what makes this father good. What are the three C's that he did? Now, we, can, we don't see in this story about consistency. We can assume that, that he probably had some consistency. Now, the second C is choice. Say it with me, choice. So the first C is consistency, second C is choice. The father allowed the son to make a choice. Making choices is very important for children. We need to allow our children to make choices. You can start with little choices when they're little. Okay, what color shirt do you want to wear? What um, fruit would you like to eat? What would you uh, like to have for supper? We want to give them some choices. Now, we need to be prepared for whatever choice they make. So the only choices we want to offer them are some that we're willing to accommodate. Uh, sometimes you can use this in your discipline or making your child do something. You want to give them the choice, the opportunity to make a choice, and that develops responsibility. Okay, your kid's lingering, and it's time to go. Okay and I said this so many times to my kids, okay, Mason, you can come holding, your, holding my hand or you can come walking on your own. The point is they're coming with me, right? But they're making the choice to hold my hand or to come on their own. So you give them little choices when they're little so that they can learn how to make bigger choices when they're big. Now, the father let the son make the choice. He didn't say, no, you can't do that. He let him make the choice to go and even to squander the money. Now, we can offer some suggestions on these choices. This is a whole other workshop, a whole other seminar on choices and allowing them to make choices. Now, let's look at what the next C is. Consequences is another C. So we have consistency choice. Now we have consequences. Did the father allow the son to suffer the consequences of his choice? Yes. Did he go and bail him out? No. He let that son realize and learn from his own choice. It says in verse 17, when the son, when he came to his senses, when he came to himself. So he learned from his own choice. He learned from the consequences of his choice. We need to let our kids suffer consequences and not always bail them out of their mistakes. The difference between biblical godly parenting and enabling them. Enabling them makes them just continue to, to do the same thing over and over, and we don't want them to do that. And the last C, we've got consistency, choices, consequences. The last C is compassion. As the father was looking for his son, and the son came back, in verse 20 it says, and he felt compassion for him. When the son came back, did the father say, I told you so, I told you you'd mess up? If so, the son would have gotten all defensive about it, right? Right? He felt compassion on him. And I've used this so many times with my kids. I'm sorry that you've spent all of your money and now you don't have any money to spend. <laughs> I'm sorry. So what are you going to do next time to make sure you have enough money so that you can buy that that you want? So show compassion. 
It keeps them from being defensive, and it shows unconditional love. Now, aren't these, these four C's what God uses with us? He uses these elements in his relationship with his children. Consistency, say them with me, consistency, choice, consequences, and compassion. So what is the outcome of this type of parenting? Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 as we wrap up. Let's look at verses 10 and 11. Then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build, and houses full of all good things which you did not fill, and hewn sisters which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and you shall eat and be satisfied. The you is collective here. It refers to the you in verse 2, so that you and your son and your grandson. When we are godly biblical parents, it doesn't only affect our children, it affects our grandchildren and the grandchildren of our children. So you is collective here. And it's like a residual income. It's like royalties. It keeps coming. It keeps coming back. And what does God say he will do? He will bring us into the promised land. And we shall eat and be satisfied. It's like eating at the feasting table in heaven with our children. That is the greatest mission. We have no greater mission than to make disciples of our own children. And it may seem impossible today in this world of chaos and confusion with stabbings and bus crashes and bullyings and shootings and sexual exploitation on the streets and in the media. But God has given us the tools and the resources, such tools like the four C's, choices, uh, consistency choices, consequences, and compassion, and the daily strength to do this mission. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. He will help us to make this mission impossible a mission possible. Please join us in looking in your hymnals at hymn number 369, 369, Bringing in the Sheaves. Please stand.
Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will keep this mission of bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves that are far away in this world, bringing in the sheaves that are in our neighborhood, bringing in the sheaves that are in our home. Heavenly Father, help us to use your tools, but especially your Holy Spirit. All the time, in the morning, at noon, in the evening, in everything that we do, that we are fulfilling your mission of bringing disciples to you. And we long for the day when you will take us into the promised land and we can eat at the feasting table with all of our loved ones, but especially with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. It's time now for the children's story. Children, come and gather the offering that goes to Christian education. We have Brother Mike, Uncle Mike here, to share our story. Thank you, Miss Julie. Wonderful message. Amen. Okay, guys, come on down. Maybe if somebody is holding up a dollar, you could pick it up. Maybe even a five dollar. Pick it up and bring it on down and it'll all go towards the worthy uh, student fund. Come on down. Here we come. I see some over here being held up. Here's one. Mr. Johnny has one. It's good to see Mr. Tim here today. Hey. It's good to see everybody here today. Good shot. Thank you. Hey. Hey, buddy. Come on down. I hope my hair is in place. Doreen was back there messing with it. And one thing I hate is for my hair to be out of place. It just gets in my eyes all the time. Come on down, guys. Hey. Hey, buddy. How are you? Okay. Here we go. We've got help from mom, too. That's always good help. Okay. You know what? I like to sit down here with you guys. Okay. Would somebody like to have an opening prayer? Ah. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Please help us to listen and please help us to be good to everyone and please help us to people that are in the hospital. Please help us to make them better in Jesus' name. Amen. I didn't want everybody behind me to think I was a plumber. <laughs> but uh, this story is about, do y'all know what this is? Yes, it's a lock. And do you know what this is? You got to have a key to open a lock, don't you? You put it in, let's see, and it pops open. You know, I was reading about another lock in the paper the other day. Have you ever heard of this man who's very big in technology, making things simpler? He's, it's what I believe technology really is. But his name is Bill Gates. Has anybody ever heard of Bill Gates? He's, he owns this company called Microsoft. And at his home, when he walks up to the front door, when he speaks his name, I'm Bill, his front door unlocks and opens for him. Isn't that amazing that he can just speak his name? Now, do you think that's something that's new? I don't think that's new. I think that's very old technology. And I believe that the first person to use that technology was God. Because what is this? 
Bible. Yeah. It's just in a case. You unzip it. You open it up. And you start to read. And I've read the Bible for years. But I was like so many other people. I said, I just don't understand. But then I found out there's a key to the Bible. Do you know what the key to the Bible is? It's Jesus. Just like when she was praying, her first words were, Jesus, let us hear. And when we use the key with the Bible, it opens up all of the knowledge that God wants us to have. You know, we re I read something in the Bible, and a year later, I go back and read it again, and I've asked God to, through the, His Son, Jesus, to open the doors for me. And I understand what He wants me to understand. And I can use that in my daily life. So anytime that I am a problem, I always ask for Jesus, which is the key, the key to everything. When you ask in Jesus' name, it will be revealed. I believe that wholeheartedly. So when I think about the Bible, I think of it as kind of a, a lock. And when I use the key, which is Jesus, to open the Bible, it opens all of the mysteries to me and lets me understand it. That's my story for today. Would somebody like to have a closing prayer? Oh. <laughs> Dear Jesus, the blessed person who uh, until with blessing. Amen. Amen. Beautiful prayer. Thank you, guys. Just two announcements this morning both very important. Number one, we want to welcome in Mordecai Dixon into the position as deacon and the church acts as nominating committee when nominating committee is not out. So is there a motion we accept him as a deacon? There is a motion. Is there a second? All in favor say aye. aye. Wow, that was good. Any opposed? We want to welcome he was ordained, I believe, last Sabbath. And the other one is this Friday night is a beautiful time to be here. Um, I don't get to this church very often on a non-Sabbath morning because of work and school and all the rest, but we have a special service that I'm, the pastors and I want to emphasize, and that is we have an agape feast here in our church on Friday night. Now, is Friday special? Why is Friday special? For two reasons, actually. One is because we begin the Sabbath together, which I enjoy. But two, it's Good Friday. It's Good Friday. Um, now I want to ask you the trick question. W what begins Monday night? Anyone know? It does. My Jewish teacher told me Thursday night that Passover begins Monday night and lasts eight days. Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover. And... Um, we don't celebrate that in our church, but they have some interesting things that they can do and what we can learn, and that is during this time of Good Friday, Rest Sabbath, and Easter Sunday, uh, and Passover, we can draw closer to God. This is the time, because other people and other faiths in our church, and even us as we celebrate together, I think it's a good time, and as Julie has given us the mandate to extend our education of the Ten Commandments into our workplace, I think now is the time. People are thinking about God, and this is a key week, so I want to invite you to come join us and let us know. I want to suggest bring the stories to the Agape Feast to let us know how God has impacted you and your witness during this coming week, and only if we are surrendered and open to his leading will that take place.
Other than that, I invite you to stand now. We want to have a distinct closing of this service and the beginning of the next service. So I want you to stand with me as we have a word of prayer. We'll have a five-minute break, and then we'll enter into our sharing time. And this is something we're trying to do that's new so that some people would go to the bathroom so they're not leaving during our services and so that we can have this distinct. So let's pray together. Let's talk to our Lord and Savior. Father God in heaven, with joy we have worshipped you. And we have heard the encouraging words from the story of the prodigal son. We've heard the words from you that has said that we are your children. So, Lord, bless us. Allow us to be fit vessels for you to witness through us throughout this coming week. And, Lord, we long for the time when we can talk with you face to face. But, Lord, until then, we have prayer, and we know you hear and answer according to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.